year, millions of individuals around the world die because of cancer. Scientists have spent decades trying to understand some of the key driver genes and genetic mechanisms that cause this uncontrolled cellular proliferation. But one of the major problems is that a lot of this genomic data is termed one-dimensional, meaning that it considers DNA as if it's in a linear sequence. However, DNA, being approximately two meters long, has to fit inside the nucleus of a cell, which is approximately six micrometers small. As a result, DNA exhibits extensive folding within the nucleus that contributes to this 3D genomic structure. CTCF is a protein that binds to the, uh, certain regions of the DNA and mediates this 3D genome structure. And the way that it works is by binding to DNA and coming together to form these DNA loop structures. And the reason why these loops are important is because in normal cells, they hide individual oncogenes. However, in cancer cells, these loops are disrupted, allowing these oncogenes to be released, activated, and allow the cancer itself to thrive. Therefore, in order to redefine our understanding of tumor biology and build a better understanding of genetic mechanisms that cause this uncontrolled cellular proliferation of cancer, we need to understand 3D DNA interactions. So far, we've been using experimental techniques to study these interactions. However, there are two key problems with these methods. The first is that they lack a genome-wide analysis, making it difficult to characterize DNA interactions across the entire genome. The second problem is that it, there, these methods are prone to a high amount of background noise and false positives. And both of these problems are illustrated by the fact that less than a dozen labs have actually been successful at generating these, this experimental 3D interaction data. So we've moved on into computational methods. And the gold standard right now is CITD, developed by Chen et al. just a few months ago. However, there's one key flaw with CITD. And it's that it generally predicts large regions of DNA interaction, and it doesn't actually pinpoint where individual loops occur and what genes are being affected. And that's the inter information that we need in order to better understand how genetic mechanisms drive cancer proliferation. And so in light of the problems with current approaches, our approach is to use a machine learning algorithm to efficiently and accurately predict individual DNA loop locations that occur across the entire genome. The idea being that we can use one-dimensional genomic data in order to predict 3D interactions in our genomes. So here's an overview of our machine learning tool and our pipeline. We begin with data acquisition and go through multiple pre-processing steps in order to optimize the performance of our machine learning model before actually predicting our loops. And I'll go into detail about what each of these steps are. We begin with data acquisition, and our one-dimensional data source is ChIP-seq data. ChIP-seq is a data source that references the extent to which certain proteins bind to different regions of the DNA. And so the goal of this step was to be able to identify unique CTCF regions that could potentially form loops across our genome. And so the raw ChIP-seq data involved DNA sequences that binded to the genome. And so we did a peak calling on this in order to identify these unique regions that, of CTCF that occur. And we did this for three cell lines, HeLa, which is cervical cancer, K562, which is leukemia, and MCF7, which is breast cancer. And so this was the basis of our data set, identifying these CTCF regions. From here, we did a feature selection. So we began by identifying five histone modification factors, which references the, the accessibility of DNA uh, to different proteins, as well as 10 transcription factors, which are specific proteins that bind to individual sites of the DNA. And so these were the factors that we measured, the peak intensity using ChIP-seq data for all of our CTCF regions. In addition, we included additional features such as the change in ChIP-seq intensity between two CTCF regions, as well as the minimum intensity. And so this formed the basis of our actual machine learning prediction algorithm. And so once we identified these features, we moved on to our sole feature that helped determine loop prediction, and this is the correlation mapping. The general idea of this is that two genomic regions that are closer together are more likely to form a loop and therefore have a higher correlation of epigenetic factors than two genomic regions that are farther away. And so out, out, uh, the output of this correlation mapping is a symmetric matrix that references various correlation values as well as their CTCF regions in their pairs. And so you can see that for different CTCF regions, we're able to identify the correlation values. And so this formed the basis for our data set. And so this is what the final training set looked like for feeding into our machine learning algorithm, where we have pairs of CTCF regions across the genome, their correlation values, 15 differences and minimums between these transcription factors and histone modification factors that I mentioned earlier, as well as whether or not they potentially form a loop or not. There's a key problem that we noticed in our final training set, and that's class imbalance. What I mean, what I mean by this is that the amount of information we have for forming a loop or positive data was far less than the amount of information we had 
that references negative information or no loop. And so in particular, for example, we had for every data point that we had for loop formation, there was about 6,000 data points referencing no loop formation. And so this is a problem because it would actually impact the performance of our machine learning algorithm. Normally what we would do to actually to combat this problem is randomly subset out data points, but the problem with that approach is that we could take out important data points that have important information for DNA loop prediction. Instead, what we did is k-means clustering, where we identified unique clusters of data points that all share in similar genetic information profiles. And from there, we were able to randomly take out data points. So we deal with this class imbalance problem without actually losing any information. And this is exactly what we fed into our machine learning algorithm. In particular, we tested two distinct models, logistic regression and random forest regression, random forest models. However, we noticed from preliminary analysis that both of these models had their own strengths and weaknesses. And so in order to create a more powerful and comprehensive prediction framework, we created an ensemble learning method that, that combined the strengths of both of these individual models. We trained them on two cell signs and then validated and, cro and cross-validated and tested on the third. So here are results from our individual models. You can see right off the bat that our logistic random forest and ensemble learning models had a very high AUC. AUC references area under the curve, which is a performance measure for these machine learning tools. In particular, we compared these machine learning models to a naive classifier, which doesn't actually implement any machine learning and is rather a direct approach that's similar to CITD, which is the gold standard used for prediction right now. And you can see how our machine learning models outperformed the current standard, the naive classifier, which CITD implements. And in particular, we focused on the ensemble learning model because it performed the best and had the highest AUC. And we found that it had a high accuracy of 91.5%. But accuracy doesn't tell us the entire picture. We wanted to ensure that across our entire genome, our machine learning models were able to identify and be very sensitive to predicting these loops. And once again, we found a very high sensitivity of 88.9% while maintaining a low false positive rate. We wanted to furthermore justify exactly how our machine learning algorithm is predicting these loop structures. And so we did a feature selection in order to determine which features that we input into the machine learning model contributed the most to predictive ability. And what we found was that JUNE-D and CEBPB, two transcription factors that are inputted into our data set, conferred the most amount of predictive ability for these loop uh, that form across our genome. And this is interesting because JUNE-D and CEBPB are two factors that are known to play a role in CTCF loop formation. And so this is cool because without actually even inputting any information into our machine learning model, the models themselves were able to prioritize the factors that are biologically accurate and matter the most to loop prediction, suggesting a good prediction framework. We also wanted to validate our model on existing cell lines that have 3D interaction data to confirm its efficacy in loop prediction. So we chose GM12878, which is well characterized in terms of its information for these 3D interaction data. And what we found from our predictive models is that apart from a few false positives, which are represented in orange, our machine learning models were able to very accurately predict a majority of the same interactions across this, these chromosomes, uh, indicating and validating its ability to predict these 3D interactions. And so now that we know, based on our performance measures and our validation of these cell lines, that our machine learning model was indeed effective at predicting these loops, we wanted it to apply these models on existing cell lines that don't have enough 3D interaction data. So the idea is that we apply this model to HEP-G2, which is a liver cancer cell line that doesn't have any 3D interaction data, in order to identify new genes that could be impacted by these loops. And what we found was that we discovered five cancer-associated genes on chromosome one uh, that are within these DNA loops and have changes in gene expression patterns. And in particular, we focused on HES4, which is known to be a regulator of cell differentiation. Prior research has found that changes in HES4 gene expression are potentially associated with cancer, but we actually haven't determined the true genetic mechanism why. And so here's what we found, is that in normal DNA samples, HES4 is associated with an enhancer that allows these interactions to occur. But in, in cancer cells, these, this HES4 gene is within a CTCF loop, and this causes a change in gene expression that allows us to determine exactly why HES4 is implicated in cancer progression, suggesting a new genetic mechanism in which this gene is actually associated with cancer. And so just a few concluding points. On our computational method, we were able to develop the first machine learning based approach to specifically and accurately identify individual regions of DNA loops that form across the genome at a very high accuracy, high sensitivity, and low false positive rate. We validated this method on existing cell lines and were able to identify new sets of genes that could potentially provide insight into new genetic mechanisms for cancer progression. However, we did have some limitations, the first being that it requires ChIP-seq data for our models, but the good thing is that ChIP-seq is publicly available on a lot of, data, on a lot of uh, genomic databases. 
And furthermore, we only train on general cell lines. So if you want to move into personalized medicine, we need to move into that field of sequencing and identifying loops across the genome. For future work, we want to implement other neural networks, conduct genome-wide analysis, and experimentally validate these results. So just a few acknowledgments. I would like to thank Dr. Martin Ari and Caleb Leroux from the Broad Institute for supporting me with this project, as well as Connor Duffy, my tutor, CEE, RSI, and all of my sponsors for making this opportunity possible. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Pratik. Questions from the judges? Excellent presentation. I'm an oncologist, so I have to have a cancer question for you. Uh, the current treatments that we have that are epigenetic-focused fo treatments, for example, we have what are called histone deacetylase inhibitor drugs. Is it look like it may be possible to predict which patients would ben benefit from that drug by using this kind of model one day? Yeah, for sure. So the advantage of our machine learning pipeline is that like doctors can readily be able to input any chip seek information for their particular cancer cell line and output various predictions of where these loops occur. So in the end goal, what we'd be able to do is identify these unique epigenetic modifications and where these loops occur across the genome, and that might confer some information about where like certain drugs could be effective on these cancer cells. Uh, so I have a couple questions. So sure. the first, so these loops. Um, how, how big are these loops, and what is the mechanism through which they affect gene expression? Yeah, sure. So uh, for the first question about what is like the size of these loops, uh, they're pretty variable. So a lot of the 3D interaction data, um, which we were limited by in our analysis, uh, ranges in terms of loop sizes from uh, 20,000 base pairs to about one megabase. Um, so that's sort of the general size of these loops that occur. Uh, and your second question was on like the mechanism in which they, yeah. So. Uh, the mechanism in which they actually change gene expression is because oftentimes within these loops, uh, and I can go back to this diagram, oftentimes within these loops, the HES4 gene, for example, normally associates with an enhancer based on like how they form, but within these loops themselves, the enhancer is no longer within and interacting with that HES4 gene in that CTCF loop. And so that's why there's a change in gene expression. Um, that's sort of one mechanism that's, appro uh, that's proposed. The second mechanism that's proposed uh, is that oftentimes when you have very large clusters of these CTCF loops, uh, it becomes inaccessible for these various transcription factors to attach to this gene and cause an expression of it. Um, so that's why we see changes in gene expression with these CTCF loops that form. And so for, <coughs> for cells of different epigenetic state, um, do they form different loops? <coughs> and, and based on your machine learning, can you infer what are the properties of different uh, cell types that govern what loops are formed? Yeah, so definitely. Uh, in terms of that aspect, whether like the differentiation between CTCF loops across cell lines, um, that's sort of what we found in this analysis with validating the results of HES4 and its impact on CTCF loops. So we compared you know, a cancer cell line uh, and its loop formation to a normal cell line. And so we can see immediately that in a normal cell line, these loops don't occur in this particular region. Um, in terms of future work, one interesting aspect is that we can look into how these CTCF loops uh, govern uh, epigenetic regulation in stem cell differentiation. Um, and that's notable for CTCF loops and how they could impact epigenetic regulation in that aspect. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of variability in these loops, so that's sort of the idea behind studying them with machine learning prediction. Other questions from the judges? Yes. I have a quick one. Um, I noticed that I'm, I'm just assuming that all of your loops were in, among a single chromosome. You didn't consider three-dimensional interactions between chromosomes. Uh, yeah, so we haven't considered that yet just because it's easier with the data that we have right now. Um, but that's something that's interesting as, as, as long as we sort of get more experimental validation of these cross-chromosome interactions, then we can implement that very easily into our machine learning prediction. Are these loops stable or they are in dynamic equilibrium? They form and uh, they disappear. Yeah, so as, the, as, you know, for example, certain, as normal cell like, goes into cancer state, these loops are able to form based on certain mutations in particular regions. Um, but overall, the loop structures themselves are very stable. In fact, there's a protein called cohesin that's actually an anchor protein that keeps these loops very stable and uh, you know, together. So these loops aren't very variable. The only time they change is when a cancer, from, for example, when a cell is going into different cell states. So normal to cancerous, you know, for example, skin cell to a heart cell and stem cell differentiation. Thank you. Yep. Any further questions from the judges? Any audience questions? Yes, sir. So my question is how much difference there is uh, in the loop structure between different individuals? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, so that's, um, 
So the question was, how much difference is there in loop structure between different individuals? Uh, so we haven't actually studied that yet, just because we've been focusing on generalizing our models to various cell lines, uh, the three that we chose, so breast cancer, leukemia, and cervical cancer. Um, so that, as I mentioned, in the future step is as we move on to an age of personalized medicine, we would want to study these individual changes. Although what we have noticed so far is that these loop structures seem to stay very consistent across a variety of cells within a particular cell type. Um, and so, for example, if we were to take you know, a sample of like a heart from uh, and heart cells from a patient, a lot of the heart cell samples that we get would have very similar CATCF uh, looping regions. So I think between different patients, ethnicity and different environmental factors could play a role in epigenetic regulation. Uh, but that's something that we're still looking into considering. Yes, one final question. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the question was essentially talking about whether or not these uh, CTCF loops are a mechanism or some sort of indicator of cancer progression. Um, so yeah, these loops not necessarily are like an actual indicator of cancer progression, although we've noticed changes in difference between these CTCF loops that occur between normal and cancer cells. I would say that these loops themselves provide a mechanism in which we can change gene expression of cancer genes. Um, and so in terms of like actually making this clinically relevant, uh, there are really two key approaches. The first, which was mentioned previously, is that you know, we can look at these loop structures and better understand which epigenetic-based drugs to target these patients with. Um, the second major application is that we can use techniques like gene editing in order to edit these gene editing uh, and to like edit these specific regions that are mutated that causes changes between normal and cancer cells. And so because of, by doing that approach, we can sort of fix these disrupted loops that occur. So those are two key clinical applications that we could use uh, by understanding these CTCF loops. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thanks again, Pratik. Thank you.